How does one get endometriosis? How does it arise? And we don't know the answer to this for sure, but we have three kind of prevailing theories about how one might get endometriosis. The first one is called retrograde menstruation. So the idea that menstrual flow, the shedding of the endometrial lining would go backwards. So instead of leaving the body through menstruation, the menstrual tissue would go backwards and that point of exit going backwards is the fallopian tubes. And then from there would go into a large cavity called the abdominal pelvic cavity and it would kind of seed organs there, like the outside of the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, etc. So that's called retrograde menstruation. But the reason that we don't all agree upon that one is because we can't explain how it would get above the diaphragm. So let's just say into the lungs or the central nervous system, which have been reported on rare occasions. So there's gotta be something more to it than that. Additionally, we recognize that many women will have some kind of retrograde menstruation, but it simply won't last. So in other words, with an endometriosis situation, the retrograde menstruation actually turns into what we term endometrial implants. So kind of like seedings or blisters around the pelvic cavity, and those will remain. They won't go away. So there's got to be something more to it than that. The next theory is metaplasia, turning into a different tissue. So that's what metaplasia is, is going from one tissue to another. And so this would explain things like distant disease, right? So it's not near the uterus, it's somewhere far away, and we think that maybe it couldn't get there through retrograde menstruation, so it was transformed. Finally, the last one would be spread through the vascular or lymphatic system. So we have kind of a plumbing system, if you will, of blood flow throughout our body, right? And there's also a parallel system called the lymphatic system. And so those would provide a conduit from getting from one place to another. Normally our blood cells are, are driven through the vascular system and that's how we get our oxygenation and nutrients and things like that. And so in this theory, menstrual tissues or endometrial tissues would be transferred from one part of the body to another and that's how endometriosis could arise in more distal locations. Now, underlying all three of these, is the prevailing thought that there is some association with immunology, so immune function, and genetics. So there could be some predisposition. So oftentimes with patients, we'll hear that family members were affected by endometriosis, and so it's long been recognized that there could be a strong genetic component, and those could then have some bearings on the three prevailing theories, right? So in other words, one might retrograde menstruate, but not have a genetic predisposition. That person would not end up with endometriosis where one that had had it would. It's kind of another way of thinking about that is like a two hit hypothesis, right? So you have to have both hits to actually get the disease. The other one would be immunology. So immunology is thought to play a large role. Immunology is very complex and there's effects on immune system by endometriosis and vice versa. But some kind of alteration or what we would call a predisposition. That means you were born with some kind of trait that would make it more likely that you developed endometriosis.